Number 9. Genesis, 2nd Quarter, 2022. Daniel Duda. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so pleased to have Keith Corbett, the president of Pine Knoll Canada, act as host for this session. So Keith, take it away. Good morning, everyone. At least it's morning in Canada where I am. And welcome to our Sabbath school class this morning. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to be looking at the second quarter of 2022, lesson nine. The title is Jacob, the Surplanter, and it's Genesis. Daniel Duda will be our moderator, and Larry is going to have our opening prayer. So, Larry, please go ahead. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for another Sabbath of peace, a day to reflect a day to look at the family that you have created, a day for the Pine Knoll family to get together and look at the history of how you have been with families and the challenges that you've had to deal with throughout the centuries. We thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, Amen. and for your grace and for the love of Christ who keeps us in your care. Be with us today and be with Daniel Duda as he enlightens our minds. In Christ's name we praise you. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Larry. Thank you, Keith. So we are lesson number nine on the book of Genesis, and the title uses a nice French word. So I'm sure the translators will be happy for that. So the a supplanter is someone who is taking place of another, either through force or scheming or strategy. But before we jump into the story of Jacob, and the word is found there in our memory text in Genesis 27. But before we jump into the story of Jacob, maybe we should look at the story of Isaac. Because remember, last week we concluded the story of Abraham. And we tried to get a larger view on the story of sacrifice uh, on the Mount Moriah. One of the ingenious things about Torah, about the Pentateuch, is that it's a book for everybody. Not everybody brings the same understanding, but you cannot use sacred writings to feel better than somebody else because it's a book for everybody. And one of the reasons why the book of Genesis is told in stories is that everybody can relate to stories. Everybody can get some lesson, some meaning from a story. Isaac was 37 when Sarah died. He got married at 40, but then in a true Genesis fashion, his wife, Rebecca, cannot have children for 20 years. So all major wives in the book of Genesis will be barren. And so when he prays after 20 years, God opens the womb of Rebecca and she will have children when he's 60. And so Jacob and Esau are born. Now, the story that is there in chapter 27, where Esau sold the birthright to Jacob, Talmud says that because lentils were the mourner's meal, that this was at the funeral of Abraham. Now, we don't know whether that is true or not, but that would make them both 15 years old, which would give you an interesting perspective on Esau and also on Jacob. Interestingly, the words which are used there, he saw, he ate, he does not realize that he's getting a bad deal which he would if he thought about it. But what matters for him is what he gets at the moment. At the end of Abraham's story, we have been asking the question, will the chosen son survive? As we open to chapter 22 and the story on the Mount Moriah. Now we are going to ask the question, will the chosen son gain the blessing? And before we go, however, to chapter 27, where Isaac will be 137 years old, let's have a look at Genesis 26, because the lessons immediately jump into the story of Jacob, but basically there is no lesson on Isaac at all. And one of the reasons is why is it that he is seen as a transitional character in the book of Genesis? As you will see when we read, probably instead of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the story should be Abraham, Rebecca, Jacob, because she will play a much more important role than Isaac. 
So Bob and then Genesis 26 verses 1 to 5, if you look under number 2. Is there any suggestion in the Bible that the deal that was made wasn't fair? Because nowadays, any contract made under age 18 would be, frankly, void unless a parent signed on it. So when Esau gives up his birthright, today that would actually not be binding. Has anybody ever commented on that? Or is that just considered that God kind of willed it? And so that's what was supposed to happen. Yeah, the question is how much God willed it. Now, definitely Rebecca signed on it. And we will see in the story when she says, let the curse fall on me. Obviously, she didn't think through what she was saying and got more than she bargained. Because when she says, oh, you go to my brother's house for a short while, and then I will send the message when Esau is not angry anymore, she grossly underestimated the hurt and the damage it did in the family, and she will not see Jacob anymore alive. And yeah, of course, uh, this is just a suggestion from Talmud that it happened at the funeral festivities of Abraham. There is no indication in the Bible. So you have no indication of the age, but uh, based on the fact that they ate lentils as a mourner's meal, that's where this comes. And of course, technically, Isaac signs it off as well after some questioning and he gives the blessing. And when Esau comes back and says, don't you have another blessing for me? He says, sorry, I don't. And then he gives him a blessing, but we'll go into the details anyway. So it's an interesting suggestion, yes. But from the text, we don't know how old the boys are when this happens. So Isaac is the least traveled of all the patriarchs. He never left the boundaries of the promised land. Remember when he needs the wife, Abraham sends a servant to get the wife for him. He doesn't travel, which will make it interesting for Jacob because when he needs to find a wife at tender age, 77, still listening to his mom. So be careful in the children's Sabbath school when you make the point that you see. He listened to his mom because he was at 77 that you are still supposed to listen to your mom. He goes to find find his wife on his own, but Isaac never traveled anywhere and he basically never emerges from a shadow of Abraham. Keith? Daniel, the number of times we hear about the blessing being given to the oldest son and Esau says, Father, don't you have anything, any blessing for me? And then you move on to when Jacob is blessing his sons and making almost edicts on what's going to happen with them all, the kind of people they're going to be. What was it in the blessing that was so powerful and so important? I mean, it's it's almost as if it's the hand of God handing something out to the children. And if he doesn't do it, they're absolutely doomed. So if you could shed some light on that, I would be very grateful. Yes, uh, that's a very good question, Keith. And it reveals the mindset of the day. I still remember from the days of my childhood when people still believed that you say a word and the neighbor's cow will stop giving milk, that a word had such power that something happens because of the power of the word. So yes, nowadays we have a more sophisticated scientific mindset. On the other hand, in the children saying that sticks and bones, words can't have much power over me. It's not true, actually. The words have tremendous power. So this is something that you can see that it's not only the word spoken, it's how you divide the estate. So the firstborn gets double portion. The firstborn is considered the spiritual head of the family, etc. But yes, uh, and Genesis is going to deal with this reversal of the birth order, whether it's Cain and Abel, whether it's Isaac and Jacob. Actually, yes, Abraham and Jacob and Esau, and then we will see it also with Joseph's sons, etc. So for them, this is a big deal. And in the previous quarter, when we talked about the letter to Hebrews, we noticed how even the New Testament writers will consider heavenly Jerusalem, the city of Zion, as the gathering of the church of firstborns, plural. So it's used as a title of preeminence, as a title of position. Ah, Some interesting studies about the birth order and the impact it has on the psychological profiles of people. But in our world, we would not pay that much attention to that. You know, we would see more that each child develops its character as they do. Okay, but an interesting question. Anybody else wants to comment on the blessing and the firstborn? Colette? These thoughts are kind of triggered from a book that I read by Rabbi Sachs on Not in God's Name. And he was talking about the blessing of Jacob and Esau 
And he made some references to different characters, like we're talking about Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and Esau and Joseph and his sons, and that there were two different blessings. There was a spiritual blessing and there was the blessing of actual worldly goods. And that how the younger brothers, even though they all ended up with worldly goods, it was the spiritual blessing. And that spiritual blessing put them in a line of dependence on God, whereas the older brothers were more resilient, the warriors, the hunters, and that the ones that God was calling to be his chosen people, not that the older brothers were rejected, but the ones that he called to be his chosen people were the ones that were dependent in a spiritual. And he talked even about how Israel was taken into a land where they depended on God for water. They didn't have the Nile. You know, there were a lot of spiritual implications there. And I just found it interesting that the the quotes chosen ones were the ones that had to be more dependent on God. And we will deal with this in the next lesson as we close the life of Jacob before we go into the life of Joseph. So there will be another look or the larger view on Esau. I certainly plan on that one. Gary? It wasn't just that you had this blessing, but associated with it, if I remember right, there was a lot of responsibilities associated with that. So it wasn't just, well, I have these goodies or whatever it is and I'm privileged, but there was certain things that you are expected to do in that position. So it's sort of like today, a lot of people like the goodies, but they don't like the responsibility. It's a good way of putting it. All right, Terry, can you read chapter 26, verses 1 to 5? Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to King Abimelech of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Settle in the land that I will show you. Reside in this land as an alien, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will fulfill the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands, and all the nations of the earth shall gain blessing for themselves through your offspring. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Okay, so here you learn that God appears to him, that he warns him not to go to Egypt. So in spite of the fact that it's a chosen land, it's not always the most attractive because there is a famine there, but he's in Gerar, but it's incorporated in the promise to Abraham before in chapter 13, 15, and 17. And so he never left the promised land. So let's start reading from verse 6. So Isaac settled in Gerar when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he was afraid to say my wife, thinking, or else the men of the place might kill me for the sake of Rebecca, because she is attractive in appearance. When Isaac had been there a long time, King Abimelech of the Philistines looked out of a window and saw him fondling his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech called for Isaac and said, So she is your wife. Why then did you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought I might die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. Okay. Any comments on the story? Like father, like son. Uh, yeah. Terry. I was just going to say it's very familiar. <laughs> so we had the story in chapter 12 in Egypt with the Pharaoh. And we had the story in chapter 20 with Abraham, exactly with Abimelech. And also with Phil Fickle, the army commander. They are still the same. Yes, Terry? Was it exactly the same king? Yeah. Really? So remember, they are supposed to be the blessing. There is a command, be a blessing for Abraham. And so it's not exactly the blessing for the pagans surrounding. And as soon as the blessing was repeated in verse 4, he reenacts his father's deception. But this time, Abimelech doesn't fall for it. Can you see the progression? In 12, Sarah is taken by Pharaoh, and although the text does not say so, but there is an every indication that she ends up in bed with Pharaoh. Morally, it's not the big problem because Isaac will be born much, much later. 
So that's how it's seen. But God rescues the situation. Now, with second time, Sarah is taken, but obviously God visits the house of Abimelech. So he has nothing with her. And then we said that the strange thing was that, okay, the first time Abraham did not know that Sarah is important in chapter 12. In chapter 20, he already knows that Sarah is important for the fulfillment of the promise, yet he acts the same way. Now here, the surprising thing is that Rebecca has already born Esau and Jacob. So Isaac is an accomplished liar when he can convince Philistines that the mother of his two children in his party is his sister. Now, of course, as we mentioned, it's the third time the wife-sister episode, but in the first time, Abraham did not understand that Sarah was important. In chapter 20, God told Abraham that Sarah will have a child, but Abraham knew that for many decades she was barren, so he doubts that she will. But for Isaac, Rebecca has already fulfilled her role. So she has given birth to two sons and the future generation is guaranteed. She played her part. And so it shows you that for him, she's just not important. And so the book of Genesis gives you little hope that the pragmatic chauvinism of male characters is going to be changed. Keith? I was just wondering whether Abraham had told Isaac of the situation that he'd been in. And if that was the case, then you would hope that with the divine succession that was promised, Isaac would have taken notice of this. But I wonder if in typical human style, Abraham was embarrassed and didn't actually tell Isaac what had happened. So he didn't know, made his own mistakes. Okay. Larry? The thing that strikes me, actually it's all through Genesis, is how the person, the family, that God has said that the blessing of the whole universe is going to come through, how they don't understand at the time and the amount of mistakes that they continue to make, which appear to be the same mistakes over and over again. I was thinking when Gary was talking about what the blessing and the responsibility, one of the key things that the responsibility was is that that person was supposed to be the, the religious leader or the priest. And it seems like this has been a stumbling block all the way through, even up to Mount Sinai when we get there later. The idea of being a nation of priests, that everybody wants to be blessed, but nobody wants to be blessed enough to actually have to do the work. Okay, thank you. Bob? Considering these people don't like to have these things open, who wrote all this down? Who preserved all this for Genesis? Did they have scribes then that were sort of keeping track? Because these stories aren't exactly uplifting. I mean, if you're trying to have a wonderful record. So do these people later write down all their misdeeds or do we have any insight on that? So obviously they are part of something that they repeat around the family fire and the camp and then hand down in the generations together with the genealogies because they are so important. And then somebody writes it down at certain point. Traditionally, that is associated with Moses when he was in the desert of Madian. But obviously these stories are circulated in the family. This is their connection with the past. So... But obviously what we have is just a version which is much later than when it happened. So nobody writes it down as it happens. And you can see there is a theological intention behind the stories. So as I said at the beginning, what we are going to study the next three weeks are some of the most widely read and influential stories in the history of civilization. And you can't use Genesis to create another elite because one of the reasons why they are put in this story form is because it's universal, written for all against the elites. So there are no spiritual elites. Nothing is idealized about the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's all there, warts and all. Elisa? Initially, I'm a little bit skeptical of these stories. And if a student were writing a story for me, I'd say, you told that story five pages ago. You're being repetitious. What's the issue here? You know, change it around. And obviously, that's not how the Bible narrative follows. There's the story. There's the repeat of the story, almost exactly the same. And then we tend to be 
well, how could he have made that same mistake when his father made the mistake and the grandfather made the mistake and all those mistakes? But I venture to say that if you look at our lives, we keep making the same old mistakes, you know, no matter we have supposedly in our age data We don't make decisions unless they're data-driven. I say this all the time in education. They probably get tired of my saying it, but, you know, we make a decision based on data. And they had a lot of data, theoretically, but they still made the same bad decisions. And I venture to say we continue to do the same thing. So the moral of my story, or not my story, but the story that God is telling there in Genesis is, you know, wait a minute, you people who are reading it down in the 21st century, you may criticize those guys, Abraham and Isaac and the women. However, gosh, aren't you doing the same thing? Yeah. And notice he says that he's afraid that he will be killed. So he thinks the worst of foreigners. He immediately assumes that the interest in Rebecca is of sexual nature. Yet we learn in verse 8 that he lived in the country for a long time. Yet not a soul made any move for Rebecca. And the king says to his men, we respect the property of another man. So we are not going to do this. So What King says, we have some morals here, yet he assumes that he's going to be killed by these Gentiles who have no morals. And so it's another example where the book of Genesis shows that in comparison to the nations around them, the offspring, which is supposed to be the blessing, actually is far from being a blessing. And so we will have these indications as we progress through the story that clearly attack this idea of being a spiritual elite that somehow being chosen or having the truth makes you better than someone else. Sean, humanity looks quite bad here, but God looks very, very good. I'm really impressed that in this account, we have as much indication that Abimelech and these pagan leaders have almost as much moral integrity as those who have been called of God. And this is very heartening for me in my own life. As I rub shoulders with people, I'm well reminded that what I bring to them is only a partial offering of what God has to offer for me through them. And I think Abimelech shows from chapter 20 on up through that God is able to touch and use and guide situationally through even those that we might not consider to be morally true. So I'm really impressed with God's ability to change his delivery of salvation through the various situations that occur. Yes. And you can see that Abimelech is a man of principles, of higher moral principles, both in chapter 20 and learns very quickly. So his announcement of capital punishment for any of his men who would interfere with Isaac and Rebecca is understandable in the light of his previous experience in chapter 20, where the Lord warned him of death if he would transgress against Sarah. So he learns and the chosen seed does not learn. So that's where you can see the indications in the book of Genesis. And we'll pick it up when we ask about why the whole chapter about Dina. So keep this in mind. Henry? When Abraham was in pain attention, that he comes up with a lie, God decides that he can speak with a pagan to somebody that has no record on the chosen people. And he only was told once there, A, this is a sin. Don't take this woman because she is married. And 50 years later, he still remembers. God doesn't need to tell him again. He still remembers and then says, this is absolutely wrong. And we have been told before. So this is a great indication of the loving God that it was not only trying to reach to Abraham and his descendants, but he was actually trying to reach to everybody there. And whoever was willing to listen, listen. And the ones that didn't want, no matter how close God was with them, they were not paying attention. Yeah. Terry, can you read verse 18, chapter 26, verse 18? Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the names that his father had given them. Okay. Can you see that he just simply plows the same furrow as Abraham? hardly deviating to the left or right. Interestingly, in the covenant in chapter 21, when Abraham says that Abimelech's servants have done him harm, 
Abimelech says, I had no idea about this. And so they struck a covenant that will recognize Abraham's rights over the well. However, in chapter 26, the initiative is reversed. Abimelech fears that Isaac will harm him. He knows that he can't trust Abraham or his son, Isaac. And so they have this treaty in verses 29 to 31 about mutual non-aggression. Whether Abimelech's fears are justified or not, it is interesting that the roles are reversed and a foreign king, pagan king, approaches the patriarch with fears that necessitate covenant. And so how Abraham and his posterity and his descendants will become a blessing to the nations, we do not know. And that's where the chapter moves forward. But it's interesting that The story of Isaac family, if you look under number two, is there any lesson that famous and successful parents can learn from this? That basically Isaac is unable to establish his own life. All he does is he just reflects the story of Abraham, repeats it, and he never emerges from his shadow. Iris? Our reflection reminded me of something I learned years ago about organizational psychology. When you have an entrepreneur who starts a new business, who is a visionary leader. That is often what is happening even in organizations. The succeeding leader will kind of do what we saw Isaac doing, and that is really securing the legacy of that pioneer leader, doing the same things. And the problem is in organizations that often can lead to stagnation because time is moving on past. It is not the same time as when the pioneer was establishing the business or the organization. And it's often not until a generation afterwards or the next leader comes that there is a reassessment and also an organization ready to now deviate and possibly from the path of the original leader and to do the things differently. Now, of course, in, you are taking it to the realm of family. And here, it, I think it is a kind of like, can you even escape it? Can you escape being the firstborn? Can you escape the situation in which you are cast? But I think to be intentional as parents, to not expect your child to be the exact copy of you, <laughs> that may be a take-home lesson that I can embrace. Yes, very good. And it's so important. One of the reasons why, as I said, this is told in the form of stories is that stories have different layers of meaning and significance. And also they have different significance to you at different stages of life. So as you grow, your understanding of the story grows. Anytime you read it, you find something else. And one of our attempts in this quarter is, okay, can you see something else when you read the story now than what you learn in the children's Sabbath school? Because you all know these stories, but do you see the family dynamics now that you did not see in the children's Sabbath school? If you look at number three, okay, when you read the story of Jacob and Esau today in your culture, at this stage of life in 21st century, what do you see there? Because it is going to have a different meaning for you now than it did when you were six or eight years old and you heard it for the first time in children's Sabbath school story. They are more than cute stories. There is profound theology to them. And we try to show that with both the story of Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, and in the subsequent stories. All right, so let's move to chapter 27, the story of Jacob and Esau. We are asking the question, will the chosen son gain the blessing? Now... There are similarities with chapter 22 and the sacrifice of Isaac. In both, he is the victim, once as a son, second time as a father. In both, he uses my son and I am here several times. It's interesting the tension that is applied. So Rebecca calls Jacob my son and Isaac calls Esau my son. Isaac does not call Jacob my son at all in the story, only when he masquerades as Esau. And interestingly, Rebecca never calls Esau my son. She never speaks for him in all the Genesis account. And so the narrator needs to remind us that her elder son Esau and her younger son Jacob in verse 15 of chapter 27, none of the children is called their son, even when it would be appropriate, like in verse 5. So Esau is his son, And Jacob is her son in verse 5 and 6. 
And so you can see the parental division and favoritism. Once again, Isaac does not step out of the shadow. You would expect that having seen what it does to him and Ishmael, the buck will stop with him. Wait until we read the story of Joseph in two weeks' time, how this is played, and he's completely unaware of what's going on in his own family. You have that famous oracle where Rebecca is a pious wife. And if you look under number two, I ask, how does Rebecca transition from being an ideal wife? Remember when you meet her at the well and her response to go and say, yeah, when the servant tells the story of the family, she says, yeah, I want to be part of what God is doing. She goes and she becomes a wife. She comforts him. She takes care of him. All the time, she will be taking care of the husband. Then she cannot have children. Isaac prays and she inquires of the Lord when she discovers that she's going to have twins, etc. So we have this famous oracle from God that shows that the older will be serving the younger, but we don't know how. But then, as the story develops, she becomes a scheming mother. And she is the one who takes initiative and she is the one who orchestrates events while Isaac is a passive Terry, can you read chapter 27, verse 1? When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. Have you heard this before? My son. And he answered, Here I am. That's Genesis 22. But he was old. And read verse 2. Next verse. He said, See, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, he's 137. Abraham lived to be 175. He says, I'm going to die any day now. So so let's get this over and done and finished. So let's deal with the question of the blessing. The guy is going to live 43 years after. Now, as far as the story is concerned, he is dead after this. So he will not be mentioned after when Jacob comes back from Haran and he finally ends up home after 43 years. He just comes on time when Isaac dies. So, yes, Iris. One of the things that in these lessons that I have learned is to see the disconnect between the promise of God and the human reality as it presents itself while we read the story. So there is this lofty, powerful promise. And then there is the reality of being in the desert. There's the reality of famines and all of that. And I think that's also what Rebecca has been facing. God has given her a promise. And the question that we face whenever God is giving us a promise is, does he need our help to make it happen? And I think that is a theme in our study of Genesis. Yes. Can we stay in a posture of faith when things are seemingly not unfolding right? Can we restrain and stay in a posture where we wait on God to make it happen? Or do we perceive it as an invitation to influence, to make it happen ourselves? Yep. Thank you. Michael? Were these oral histories that were handed down from generation to generation and then later written down? Yes. So traditionally, Moses is the one who writes it down. That's why the book of Genesis is called the first book of Moses. But of course, this happens 500 years before Moses. So it was handed down orally through the generations. Well, there's lots of evidence that oral histories are very, very accurate. Oh, yeah. And we have some stories from Africa where they memorize the genealogies. I mean, that's their ID card. So especially genealogies are very important to know whose family and whose relative you are. So, And because they use memory so extensively, it's very different than our contemporary memories where we have all the cheat sheets that help us to remember things that we need to remember. And so we don't use memory that much. John? Abraham, after the death of Sarah, again, has more children through another wife. And in Genesis, he sends these sons away. The disconnect between Jacob and Esau is far broader than that. It seems to affect the whole family. My point is, what effect did it have upon Abraham's sons who were sent away? Just going to lead to a huge amount of bad feeling within the family. And it seems Abraham doesn't trust his other sons to leave Isaac, the chosen son, alone and allow things to go on. Yep. Thank you. Dan? 
I'm going to refer back to one of Graham Maxwell's favorite quotations from Ellen White, in which Satan accuses God of being tyrant and being severe, exacting, revengeful, etc. And it seems to me that what we see in these various stories is that God is exactly the opposite. If God was the way Satan had characterized him, God would be taking it out on these people lives we're studying right now. Instead, he shows an unusual amount of patience, unusual amount of compassion for human frailties, and he's exactly the opposite of the way Satan has accused him of being. And so I think these stories are very comforting because it does show me, at least, the kind of God that manifests himself in the New Testament, in Jesus. And so it is comforting to know that God is consistent. He doesn't change. He was the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Okay, chapter 27 from verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me game and prepare for me savory food to eat, that I may bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my word as I command you. Go to the flock and get me two choice kids, so that I may prepare from them savory food for your father, such as he likes, and you shall take it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to his mother Rebekah, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word and go get them for me. Okay, thank you. So, notice... Can you read chapter 25, verse 23? That's the oracle prediction that Rebecca hears from God. Chapter 25, verse 23. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Now, there is no indication whether Rebecca told Isaac about this, whether he is aware of the transfer of the birthright from Esau to Jacob, that he sold the birthright. So once again, you see the family dynamics. We don't talk about these things, as Karen mentioned. Yeah, sometimes when someone in the family doesn't feel like they have voice or a power, which I imagine Rebecca might not have felt that, then then they will resort to some kind of manipulation because it's the only way they can make a difference, get what they want, get their way. So rather than trying to talk it through, they'll just manipulate behind the scenes. And that's quite a common thing when someone feels it's the only way to get what they want. Yeah. So you notice that we don't know whether Isaac is aware of what happened in chapter 25 with the selling the birthright or whether he's aware of what the Lord told Rebecca. But interestingly enough, he calls only one son, Esau, and gives the instructions to him. Now, Rebecca is listening, and not only listening, but immediately she calls her younger son and she gives him the commands, and she is in charge of the events. She says, I will prepare it because I know the way he likes it. Then she says in verse 8, therefore, my son, obey my word as I command you. So there she is. And then even she says, and don't worry about the curse, let the curse fall on me. Rita? I noticed that 27 verse 1, Esau responds, here I am, which I think means that here I am, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. Yep. But at no point does Jacob respond like that to Rebecca. It's almost the opposite. He's saying, but this is a lie, mum. Yeah. But notice so, Rebecca knows that if Isaac can lie about her identity to Abimelech, why can't her son Jacob give him a taste of his own medicine? She's aware, but she's still scheming and she's fully in control. So Esau must go and hunt his game. He must prepare his food. But Rebecca is the active character. She persuades Jacob, she instructs him, she prepares the food. And that's why you can see that instead of the traditional of patriarchal line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, one needs to wonder whether it should be Abraham, Rebecca, and Jacob. She certainly outperforms both her husband and her mother-in-law. Sarah was always in the shadow of Abraham. She overheard about the firstborn, but first she laughed and then she 
came with a strategy so that Ishmael is born. But Rebecca says, obey my word as I command you. Sean? It seems that there's some evidence here in this very narrative of how we see generational sin developing into the individuals involved. Jacob, after his mother said, please obey me, do what I am telling you, Jacob does not put up resistance at a moral or ethical level. He puts up resistance in how is this going to get done so I don't get caught. To me, that's some evidence that there is a waning of a moral rectitude in Jacob. He's confused as to what's right and what's wrong and concerned about how not to get caught. It seems as though this is some evidence of how these developments take place from father to son, from mother to son here in this very story. Okay, so you see the similarities with chapter 22. My father, here I am. And when he says, okay, uh, Terry, can you read verses 18 and on? So he went in to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father, Isaac, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Hebrew says, so he proceeded to bless him. This translation seems to indicate that he blessed him twice, but there at the end of verse 23, it should be, he was about to bless him or he proceeded to bless him. But he has one more question. Okay, you can read 24. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said. And there comes the blessing. Do you see that the treachery is sealed with a kiss? That will be repeated in the Bible, okay? Interestingly enough, that for the first time, Isaac puts up some resistance in the story. So he questions, how come that you came so quickly? And now Jacob, who said, I am Esau, your firstborn, I put in the study notes, what are the implications for his identity? What is your name? I am Esau, your firstborn. He's playing to be someone who he is not. But he wants to quit, he say. You know, he says to him, verse 19, now sit up and eat my game so that you may bless me. So he wants to have it as quickly as possible. But Isaac puts the resistance. How come that you found it so quickly, my son? So he needs to elaborate on his lies. And so now he pulls God into his lying. The Lord, your God, granted me success. And then he says, come near that I may feel you, my son. That's the only time he calls him my son because he thinks it's Esau. So that whether I know if you it's Esau or not. And so he went there. He felt him and said, okay, voice is Jacob's, but the hands are certainly hands of Esau. And then he said again, I really my son? He answered, I am. Okay, bring it to me. Now you expect that he's going to ask, is this really game, my son? But that's where Rebecca did a good job. So he did not ask that question. And you just wonder what would Jacob say to that? But then he proceeds and he gives him the blessing. All right. I was wondering if this question is making too much of the words here, because in verse 20, when Jacob answers his father about how quickly he found the meat, he answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me access. I wondered if there was anything important about Jacob saying to Isaac, your God, because God is God of all of us. However, then I wonder, well, in the Bible, I see my God, God, the father of you and me. And is there anything about the your God. It sounds yes. to me like Isaac is not. Yeah, He lives in the house of the patriarch, yet God is not his God. 
and read the prayer and the situation with the letter and the dream later. Read what happens when he 20 years later returns from Laban, how still does not consider God his own God. It's mm. only after the struggle in Peniel that God becomes his God. Mm. Mm. When he's scared to death that Esau is coming with 400 plus men with weapons, 22 years later, showing still that he has not forgotten and he's scared to death, even uses his property and family as bribes to appease his brother. And when he realizes it doesn't work and he struggles, and only then he has an experience of conversion. Even the blessings that he received from Laban does not make Isaac's God, his own God. So it's very interesting indication in the text about his religious development. So at 77, still Abraham's God and Isaac's God is not his own God. Bob? One of the points we made earlier was how sometimes the patriarchs got in trouble when they took things out of their own hands and tried to carry out God's purposes. So would the lesson here be that they should have let Esau get the blessing and let God work it out and not use deception. But then you'd have potentially Esau being one of the patriarchs. Just a question that crosses my mind because we talked earlier about all the times they use self-help that didn't seem to work out. Now they seem to have used self-help and is this the way it was supposed to work out? And we will deal with this in the next lesson. And it will be chapter Genesis 36. You need to read chapter 36 and to see the, yeah. So what would happen if they just went ahead and said, okay, God knows what he is doing. And this is what Isaac wants. Let's leave it in his hands. He will work it out. Now notice the near miss in the story after the blessing, verse 30. As soon as Isaac finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father, Isaac, his brother Esau, arrived in from his hunting. He prepared savory food he brought to his father, and he said to his father, Notice how the story is repeated. Let my father sit up and eat of his son's game so that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your firstborn son, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently, and he said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me and I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him? And yes, a blessed he shall be, cannot take it back. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me also, father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. And then comes the memory text. And then he proceeds and he gives him the blessing, non-blessing, which is actually a blessing. And we will talk about it later. Okay, what is the result of it all? Notice that we did not hear anything about feelings of Isaac. You expect that on Mount Moria, you would read that Isaac was trembling and he was scared to death that when Abraham raised his knife, but nothing there. The only time he's trembling is here when he realizes that he's the victim of the deceit from his own son. All right. What is the result of this? Next chapter, chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. Or let's start with, you know, the chapter division was given later. So 27 verse 46. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women such as these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him. You shall not marry one of the Canaanite women. Go at once to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as a wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and numerous, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give you the blessing of Abraham, to you and to your offspring with you, so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, land that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Pan and Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Okay, so notice once again in chapter 27, 
Verse 41, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Have you heard? I will kill my brother. Have you heard that before? Yes, that's the Cain and Abel story in chapter 4. Cain succeeded in murdering his brother. Esau only plans to do that. And Cain then needs to go east, and Jacob needs to go east in order to be saved from the anger. Now, interestingly, that Esau said to himself, I am going to kill Jacob, verse 42, but the words of the elder son Esau were told to Rebekah. And so she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Have you heard this before? Now, my son, you need to do what I tell you. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay with him for a while until your brother's fury turns away. And then I will send and bring you back from there. Why should I lose you both? And notice, then Rebekah said to Isaac, I have a plan. And Isaac said, chapter 28, that's a good plan. He called Jacob and blessed him and charged him. Do you see what's going on? Esau says in his own heart, I am going to kill my brother. And the words were reported to Rebekah. She has a network of spies in the family that report to her. How does she know? And what does she do as a good scheming wife? She has a plan ready, and Isaac does not even know that he's not his idea. He thinks it's his idea, and he goes on to execute it. Karen? I was just thinking how painful it is when there is deception and favoritism and how it tears families apart so much. And we've seen it happen before in Abraham's family. There's so many of these favoritisms and these jealousies between Ishmael and Isaac and Rebecca and Isaac, and now Jacob and Esau. And each time it's tearing the family apart. They don't see each other. It causes distress, anger, violence, hurt, it affects all sorts of other relationships too. And just the one deception has power to just tear the family into pieces in so many different ways. And that takes so long to heal again. But sadly, he doesn't learn, does he? And he still continues to do that in his own family. Jacob does. So just the danger of deceiving and having favorites and tearing the family to pieces. Yeah, okay. But notice how she gives Isaac the impression that he is in control while she thought through the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And so Isaac is as passive here as he has been previously in his tent. And of course, these are her last speeches in the book of Genesis. And we will notice that while Sarah and Rachel get their death notice, she will never get her death notice only her 150-year-old nurse, Deborah, death notice, but not Rebecca. Okay, as a result of that, what happens? Jacob needs to flee the land, just as Abraham fled because of the anger of Pharaoh to Bethel. So he needs to go eastwards, and he arrives at Bethel, the same place. The author wants you to think back chapter 12, and then he has a dream. And what is the dream? What would you expect the Lord is going to tell him? Is he going to be judged by God for the lies, deception, and callous ambition that brought him to this situation? What is the dream all about? What is the message that he hears? Does he hear any judgment, any condemnation from God for his behavior? Terry? I think that he hears that God is not discarding him and that God is still involved with him and willing to be involved with him and encouragement. Yes. So no condemnation. Rita? He hears the same promise that God made to Abraham and to Isaac before yes. him. And of course, he adds that the nations will be blessed through Jacob and his descendants. And we question, okay, how? Let's read on. How is that going to happen? Because he is heading off to Haran in order to avoid marrying into the nations like his brother did. So how the nations are going to be blessed. Iris? I think it's very touching that this reiteration of the original blessing contextualized to Jacob's situation comes at a time when humanly speaking, he least deserves it. It's kind of like God is saying, you know what? Resetting, rerouting. Keep the goal in mind. I have not given up on you. You feel darkness right now. You feel like everything has shattered to pieces. But here is what my vision is for your life. And I think that's very powerful how God speaks these very affirming, very clear words of identity into the life of Jacob at a point in time when he feels like he doesn't deserve any of it. 
So here's the family therapist at its best. God is asking, what is it that this guy needs now the most? And he gives him exactly that. And notice that God was right. What is Jacob's response? Or what does Jacob's response tell you? How does Jacob respond to that revelation? Terry? Well, it looks to me like he made a memorial, a memorial to what happened there, a memorial of relief, perhaps, that he wasn't just tossed out because of his prior bad behavior, and that he has another chance to learn from his mistakes and move on. Yes, but he's concerned with his worldly needs. He's concerned with a peaceful homecoming, and he's concerned what will be with Esau. His mind is elsewhere. He's not responding to what God is telling him. So this shows exactly that God gives him what he needs to have at that moment, although he is not able at this moment to appreciate that. And of course, he starts negotiating. If you do this for me, then you will become my God. Obviously, God of Abraham and Isaac is not his God yet. Remember when you ask about your God has helped me to find the game so quickly? Michael? This narration of family dynamics is stories that play out over and over, generation after generation, up to the present time. I was raised in a family of two parents and seven children. And there was, among other things, tension all the time in their, our relationships with one another as siblings, as well as our relationships with our parents. I don't mean it was a constant upheaval by any means, but there were, I think, the children competing for the love and favoritism of their parents. That may be just a natural human reaction or unique to my experience, but it did occur. And I look at this story and the dynamic between Esau and his younger brother Jacob and his relationship with his father and his mother. That's something that I can easily relate to. Yes. Thank you. Sean? To your point, Daniel, if the original the original language is reflected clearly in the English translation, verse 20 gives us some insight into the point you are making. If God will be with me. Here's a Jacob who does not yet have a secure relationship of trust and confidence in this God. If God will be with me. Here's a transitional point, it seems, in his life from a matriarchal led relationship of deception and do as I say from a mother's perspective to a point in which Jacob is now becoming more aware of this God who could potentially help him through the rest of his life. But here he declares, if God will be with me, I think it's a point well taken if that language is translated clearly here. Yes, it's translated well, but notice God speaks to him concerning nationhood, concerning the land, and being a blessing to nations. So exactly the three things that start with Abrahamic blessing. Now his response has nothing to do with nationhood, with land, or saying, okay, now I realized what I have caused in my own family. Now I want to be the blessing broader than on my own family. No, no, no. He just picks up on the last part, and he's concerned about him and himself. And then he gives the condition, if God does this, if God proves himself, then the God of Abraham, your father and God of Isaac, notice that God identifies as God of Isaac in spite of all the failures and passivity of Isaac and that he never got out of his shade. I made a note here that interestingly enough in the Hebrews 11, the chapter on heroes of faith, Abraham has 305 words in English translation. I did not have time to count it in Greek original. Isaac has 12 words in the chapter on the heroes of faith. But God says, God of Isaac, he still accepts that. But then he says, if Yahweh proves, if God proves himself, then he will be my God as well, in verse 21. Colette? I think it's interesting the meanings of the names that Jacob ends up having. He's the deceiver, and then he ends up being the God wrestler. Yes, although the God wrestler will be in the next lesson, so we'll come to that. Karen? I think this is an incredible story of love and grace for people who feel like they're completely at rock bottom. And sometimes I use this when I'm counseling because when they feel like they failed and they just have nothing, this tells them that even when Jacob reached that point, God is with him and he brings heaven down to right where he is and says, I won't leave you and just opens up this incredible picture of, of heaven and the angels ministering. And I just think it's such a wonderful picture of grace for us all to hold when we reach those moments on the rock. 
Yes, so it's so easy when you messed up to think that even God is against me. Mm. And the picture is, no, actually the whole heaven is on your side. Yes. Now, that does not mean that what you did is okay. That doesn't mean that you are not going to pay the consequences and live with the consequences. As we said, he's not going to see his mother again. And in the next chapter, the deceiver will be deceived. He will get a taste of his own medicine from his own family, from Laban. But God says, I'm still on your side. The whole heaven is at your disposal to bless you. And once again, these stories are not about them, about Jacob, Esau. They are about God, great God that they serve. All right. So next chapter, what happens at next chapter? So Jacob retraces the steps of Abraham's servant. So you can see what's going to happen. He arrives at the well after Bethel, which was a retracement of the steps of Abraham from chapter 12 and 13. While the servant arrives at the well laden with goods and gold that impresses Laban, Jacob arrives with nothing. 97 years later, he meets a girl. He goes on to kiss her. Wow, what a behavior. She brings him home. And Laban, who was impressed with the jewels and the gold that Rebecca received 97 years ago, sees this penniless guy and he needs to explain why he's there. So chapter 29 from verse 13. When Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he ran to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And you wonder what are all these things? How does he explain that the servant came with camels and gold and jewels and he comes penniless on his own? Okay, so, and of course, whatever he told him, Laban may understand something because he's going to take advantage of the situation. He certainly is Rebecca's brother. He has not learned anything. And Jacob, for the first time, is going to meet his equal, who is as good at trickery as he is. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. You see how besotted Jacob is with Rachel because he makes an excessive promise. Laban does not enter any further discussion and takes advantage of Jacob's lack of judgment and says, okay. He doesn't say, I am going to give you Rachel. So he leaves the door open and the rest is history. You know what happened afterwards. So he works for seven years for Rachel. She is uh, just a teenager there, but in seven years, she will be an adult. And then you already start having a hunch that when Rebecca said to him that I will soon send a word for you to come back, oh, it's not going to be that soon. All right. And then comes the wedding. Now, can you tell me how the guy discovers next morning that he has been deceived? Can anyone <laughs> explain that? Jennifer? It proves to me that they were serving alcoholic beverages at the wedding ceremony. That's the okay, only way. so it's not a good Adventist wedding from 19th century, obviously. Yeah, that's what we wanted to say. And of course, the veil still might have helped in the Near Eastern context. But still, how come he discovers only next morning what happened that's beyond the comprehension of most people? By the way, you know what Talmud says? Talmud says that Rebecca was under the bed and she was answering every time when Jacob asked the question that she spoke up for her sister, which, of course, is. It's probably going a little bit too far, but still helps to explain how the guy can discover the next day that he has been duped, tricked. And interestingly enough, Leah agrees to participate in this and she will pay dearly for that. Thank you, Jennifer. Notice what he says. What is it that you have done to me? He's surprised that he gets a taste of his own medicine, which, of course, it's exactly the words that Pharaoh said to Abraham in chapter 12. What is it that you have done to me? What Abimelech said to Isaac, although he says, what have you done to us? Abimelech says to us. 
Now, interestingly enough, Laban says, because all the males of the city were at the wedding, he says next morning, let's finish the seven days so that we don't have a scandal, so that the whole city knows what trick I performed on you. And so he finishes the week, then he gets his Rachel. Interestingly enough, the story says that seven years seems like nothing to him. By the way, remember this when he will make his speech, when he leaves Laban. So Jacob will give another twist on his time there. But the next seven years, you don't hear that. But then he ended up with two sisters. Okay, let's go to chapter 29 and from verse 30. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked on my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, she named him Levi. Mm-hmm. Notice her only consolation is to be found in God. Her husband was not going to love her regardless how many children she bears. And verse 35, yes, read on. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Which means Jacob stopped sleeping with her because she has served her purpose. Now he had four males, four male children from her. Notice every time she has a child, she names the child. She mentions God in the name of the child. So she realizes whatever she does, she's not going to earn the love of her husband. Now, notice how... Rachel deals with this. If you read on, that is chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. And she said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob became very angry with Rachel and said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, here is my maid, Billa, go into her that she may bear upon my knees, and that I too may have children through her. So she gave him her maid, Billa, as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Billa conceived and bore Jacob a son. And how did she call him? Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maid, Billa, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So she named him Naphtali. Wrestled with whom? Her sister. With her sister, really? Now, how does the character of the two girls come through this? And notice when Leah names her own children, she gives thanks to God, an expression to the coldness of her husband. And then she says, okay, whatever you can do, I can do better. So she gives her servant girl. And then the names will be good fortune, happy am I, expresses her joy for more children but not her sister. She says, I have prevailed. Really? I mean, the score is still (laughs) four to two. (laughs) You have not prevailed. Jennifer? In verse 31, when she says that her husband hates her, I was wondering if that was a good translation. And I have some other comments, but is that a good translation? In some Bibles, it says he does not love me, but in some it says he hates me. That's the Hebrew way of saying, so to love less means to hate. I have loved Jacob and hated Esau. Whoever does not hate his own family, Jesus says, what does it mean? So it's an emotional, Hebraic way of expressing emotions. Well, I thought it was interesting, the comments she made each time she had a son, and since she knew he did not love her, she was going to find value in his eyes through the son she bore him. But each time she said, so now he will love me, or now he will be joined to me, or now he will honor me. And I just thought it was an interesting twist that she hired him with those mandrakes to have more children. She actually makes the comments that he was hired to sleep with her earlier that he must not have been sleeping with her anymore and that's 
why she was not having any more children. And that's why she's going to hire him for one night and hope her best. And of course, she says, if I do this, he will be a better husband. Have you heard this before? If I just do this, he will treat me differently. And what is the answer? No, no, it's not going to happen. The problem is much deeper. And so Rebecca gets her way. Of course, she never heard about Hagar. So what does she expect this will bring, this competition? Is she going to bring peace? Is that going to improve the family situation? No, it will become only worse. All right, we need to move on. And that's the challenge of this lesson. So many stories. So for the rest of the chapter, Jacob prospers at Laban's expense. And that's where you can see again his character and the character of Laban, how Laban tries to make sure he removes the male goats so that, again, the deal that he struck is to his advantage, but God is blessing Jacob so that even Laban has decided. Now, remember, Rebecca said, I will send the word and you will come back soon. Now he has been 20 years there and no word has come. And so what does it take for Jacob to go back? Chapter 31, let's pick up from verse 11. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the goats that leap on the flock are striped, speckled and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and return to the land of your birth. Then Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. We are in it with you. Notice that even the daughters of Laban are not impressed with how the father deals with him and with them. And so the next verse says, And so Jacob arose, set his children, his wives on camels, and they went away. And Laban doesn't even know for three days that they left. And then when he discovers, he's going to pursue them. And of course, he's going to pursue them in order to say, I wanted to say goodbye, to kiss them, to my great children. Once again, you get a speech which only reveals his character, which is very much contrary to, you know, see the family dynamics, what is being said, what actually is going on. And of course, there is a small hiccup because verse 30, can you read 30 to 32? Even though you had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. But anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinfolk, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Okay, and interestingly enough that Rachel considers it important to steal the family gods, probably because whoever has those is entitled to the family inheritance, the possession. And then he searches the tent and he didn't find them, which of course, verse 36, gives Jacob an opportunity and you will get an interesting perspective on Jacob and how he massages the history and how what he says, it's not exactly in harmony with what the storyteller, the narrator told you before. But, of course, he will not waste the opportunity to rub it back to him. And finally, they make a covenant. They agree that they are not going to cross this. Of course, Laban had the dream where God warned him not to be harsh to Jacob. And finally, early in the morning, Laban rose up, kissed his grandchildren and his granddaughters and blessed them. He departed and returned home. And that's where the story ends. And after 20 years, he leaves home. So what's the conclusion? Do you see the difference between the first meeting of Jacob and Laban and this meeting, the last meeting of them? Laban is pretty old because it's 97 years after the meeting with Rebecca. So he's pretty old. He's not going to see him anymore. But you can see the animosity and the differences. Yes, what goes around comes around. Thank you, Terry. That's 
very clear. Now, when you look at the characters of these people, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Esau, Laban, Rachel, Leah, when you see all the lies and deceptions involved, what's the lesson for us? Rita? I think it tells us that God has a plan and that no matter how we behave and despite the way we behave, God's ultimate goal will be achieved. And he can work with those who ultimately are willing to work with him. And I wondered in verse 11, when the angel of God said to Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. So this is the point at which Jacob now says to God, I'm ready. I'm ready to do what you want me to do now. Okay, we will comment on that in the next lesson, in the preparations he makes to meet with Esau. Jennifer, but thank you. Very helpful. Very helpful, Rita. It makes God look good that he keeps working with us no matter what. And in number nine on the lesson, it says, why is it significant that there is no attempt to idealize the families of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Leah and Rachel? Well, it gives us all hope. It gives us hope today to know that God will work with us also with all our problems. If God's family looked like this and God is not afraid to call them his family, then there is hope for you and me. Iris, thank you, Jennifer. I think this study has sensitized me to tracing the spiritual development of Jacob. We found him very much the product of an absentee father and a very <laughs> loving but also consuming mother. <laughs> And it took basically a lifetime to recover from that. And in essence, God took over. And when he started the journey, he was still very standoffish of his heavenly father. And the only reason that he probably started trusting was because what's in it for me? And he was at a point of utter darkness and a shattered life. But we see a progression, I think, and we will continue to see that chapter 35 to me is a very powerful point in that journey of Jacob, where he says, I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. I think that's very powerful that as he journeys with God, as God works with him through the past, through the family baggage, he comes to realize that God was all along there for him in the most distressing moments of his life. He proved himself faithful to him, even when he deserved none of it. And I think ultimately that leads him into a trusting relationship with God. And, and I think that's really an invitation for all of us. We are invited through the stressors of our lives and the challenges that we face to get to know God, how he really is and to enter into an intimate relationship with him, where we follow him, not because of the goodies, not because of what's in it for me, but because he deserves to be loved back because he has never held back towards us. And that is the invitation that I'm taking away from this study. Yes. And before we come to chapter 35 and 6, we will see what else happens and how God is nudging him. And, you know, it remains dysfunctional to the end, but God keeps on loving him and responding to him in a positive way. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, when we read these stories, how you treated your people in the past, we thank you for a new inspiration that there is hope for each one of us. Thank you that you know everything. You know the parts of our mind and our hearts and our thinking and our behavior that we are not proud of. Yet your grace is new every morning and you treat each one of us much better than we ever deserve. Help us so that something of this spills over to the way we treat other people so that these stories can be inspiration not only for us but for other people and this world can be a better place because you have someone who is going to be a blessing to others as you always intended. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.